even be used in toothpaste, but one of its main roles in life is to help provide half of the world with oxygen. The humble seaweed certainly has a vital job and one of its biggest fans is Alan Miller, who has discovered 50 new species during his research expeditions. Alan, discovering so many new seaweed species is pretty amazing, but how many species are there around Australia? We have about 2,000 that we think, uh, we've documented I should say, but we think we might be looking at about 3,000 species, which makes Australia the richest continent in the world as far as marine plants. But we also do a lot of collecting in the southwestern Pacific, and also because of the east coast of Australia, its aspect, on a global scale we also look at the east coast of Africa. And we've found a few similarities with some of the species there, but we're also trying to look at the, the whole sort of evolutionary aspect of the seaweeds too. So as Gondwana land was splitting up, the seaweeds went with these continents. So we've found similarities with, with South Africa and places like that. Seaweeds exist off the coast of nearly every landmass and provides shelter and food to a huge range of sea creatures. But what exactly makes seaweed seaweed? Seaweeds don't have roots like terrestrial plants. Seaweeds simply have a holdfast which attaches them to the seabed. And all the nutrients they get, they get directly by um, osmosis, basically through their plant tissue. So they're literally sitting in a nutrient soup, which is the seawater, and that's where they get all their nutrients from. So they don't have flowers either. They have spores and they have gametes, and they reproduce sexually. One of the major focuses of Alan's research is to understand where new species fit into marine ecosystems. But firstly, he has to correctly identify them all. Now, all seaweed looks pretty samey to me, so how do you know when you've discovered a new species? That's a good question. What we do initially is we collect the specimens and then we, we look at a few of the sort of common features, but mostly we go through the literature. And the literature tells us what, what has been described so far. And if we can't get a good match, sometimes we even then go and do some DNA sequencing and literally like DNA fingerprinting. And that is a really good uh, way of checking whether something has been described before. Now you've got thousands of specimens stored here around us. Do you have any favourites? Oh, I think all the seaweeds are my favourites. There's a lot of them. There's, there's as I said, 3,000 different species in Australia alone. But yeah, every now and again I pick up one that's really spectacular and sort of, yeah, you think, no, nah, that's definitely one of my favourites. And I collected one in New Zealand that I'll show you because it's, it's quite a spectacular species. And it grows only in very deep water, so it's actually probably quite rare. Oh, wow. It's almost like a watercolour painting. Marine algae was around long before life on Earth existed, which means it secured a vital role in every ecosystem. Providing oxygen for all of Earth's inhabitants, there is a lot more to the humble seaweed than meets the eye. This is a cuddle bone, and some of you might know them as the funny white surfboards that wash up on beaches, or as the things you give to your budgerigars or canaries to sharpen their beaks on. But it's actually from an animal called a cuttlefish, which is like a little fat squid, and this sits inside its body. Now this is a special structure that the cuttlefish uses to help it float. If I break one of these open, you can actually look inside and see that it's made of lots of little levels, like a little car park, and all those gaps between the levels is filled with air, and that helps these animals float in the water. Here at Museum Victoria, we're doing research into cuttlefish and cuttle bones, and I'm working with James Osborne, a student from Deakin University, and we're putting together a guide to the different cuttle bone types that wash up on southern Australian shores, so that we're looking at how they change as the animal grows, but also looking at how you can tell the different species apart, because there's 26 different types of species of cuttlefish found in Australian waters. While we're interested in studying cuttle bones, they're not anywhere near as interesting as the live cuttlefish. Cuttlefish can change shape, can change colour, they can impersonate backgrounds, match sand backgrounds, look like seaweed. They can just do the most amazing impersonations. 
They really are spectacular and beautiful animals. So there you go guys. Next time you see one of these, remember, it's not just budgie food, it's not a mini surfboard, it's from one of the most amazing creatures in the sea, the cuttlefish. It's over 53 metres long and has a wingspan of nearly 90 metres. It takes 134,000 litres of fuel and 102 people can fit inside. That's around about seven football teams, minus the physio and coach. This is the C-17, the latest and biggest ever aircraft addition to the Royal Australian Air Force Fleet. Sam, you've got the cool job of flying this monster and you're only 24 years old. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's not a bad deal. We've got our first two aircraft in Australia ever. We're waiting on the next two to come along. So it's a huge capability step up from the Hercules that we had before. Now, what's the chance of us taking a look at your office? Yeah, if you play your cards right, you can come in and have a squiz. Okay, let's go. So, Jess, here we are. Welcome to the flight deck. Now, Sam, there's a lot more room in here than I expected. And the first question I have to ask is how fast can this C-17 actually fly? Well, we cruise it around 450 knots, 800 kilometres an hour, so it's the same as the, air, the airliners. Wow, that's pretty pretty fast. Now you've flown the Hercules, but what's it like flying this plane? Well, compared to its size, it's pretty agile. You've got the joystick to begin with. It's all automated, so it's computers looking after everything for you, so it's fantastic. Now, what was it like the first time you flew the C-17? What were you feeling? Was it daunting? Yeah, it was daunting. The first couple of rides are in a simulator. So when you come out to the actual aircraft, you're walking up the stairs and you're just thrown back by the actual size of the, the aircraft itself. But once you're flying the thing, it's like any other aircraft. Now, seeing as though this plane is quite large, does that mean you need a bigger runway for taking off and landing? Now, this aircraft was actually designed to land on dirt strips, so we can pull up in around half the distance of an airliner of a similar size. So with the dirt strips, our minimum length is around 1,000 metres and 30 metres wide, and we can actually do star turns like a three-point turn in your car. And that's where our loadmasters come into it. They're our eyes and ears when we're doing that. Speaking of the loadmaster, let's meet her. Paula, you're the load master. Does that mean that you're the master of loading? Yeah, that's right, Jess. As a load master, I'm responsible for everything that comes on or is taken off the aircraft. Now, I'm blown away by just how much space is inside here. This is your chance to really impress us. How much and what can fit inside here? All right, well, this aircraft can take three to four times the capacity of a 